10 years, the parish has been spending more money than it has been taking in. The treasurer also laid out a plan which, if pursued vigorously, offers us the opportunity to dramatically change that by the time we celebrate 90 years, the church having been started in 1929. The rector has requested that I lay out certain facts. The idea being for us to get some sense as to what are the challenges we may face as we seek to achieve that goal of financial rehabilitation by the time we are 90 years of age. It is logical for any discussion about the economy to begin with the matter of salvage. And I believe Ms. Carroll has available for you a handle I provided that gives you a fair amount of facts that you could follow as I go through. But let me begin by saying <coughs> one may think of the economy as sort of a pie. Just think of a big pie. Forget the complicated terms. Think of a big pie. A pie large enough that the government can get a hefty slice. And there is still enough for everyone to get a slice. The government gets its part, and everyone can get a slice. <clears throat> As I go forward, let me go back to one point. The technical term for what I just said is called gross domestic product, GDP. And it's in constant dollars from the, the information I'm giving you. Because everything I say, when we say a dollar, we mean a real dollar. What could this year buy exactly what it could have bought last year or five years ago? That is to say, dollars after the cost of living. As I go through this, we need to understand not just where we are, but how we got here. And to understand how we got here, I need to cover a period. The period I choose to cover is 1970 to today. What has happened in the Bahamas that can help explain where we are? Having gone to 1970, that for all practical purposes is two generations. So I break it between one generation, 1970 to 1990, and what has happened since 1991. If you look at the handle I provided, it does not provide information from 1970 to 1980. The reason for that is, for parts of that period, we had no central bank in the Bahamas. We had no department of statistics in the Bahamas. So no one was keeping score, so to speak. Fortunately, the Inter-American Development Bank has provided some analysis, which tells us that from 1970 to 1979, the Bahamas was doing okay. The pie, the pie was growing every year by 3.3%. Not bad. Now, if you look at the chart, you would notice that even the first column, you would even notice that from 1980 to 1990, the pie kept growing. Each year, except 1981. And while 1981, the pie did not grow, when you look at 82 and 83, the, the pie grew plenty by more than 6% each of those two years. So that pretty, wiped, pretty much wiped out the bad year that was 1981. And I believe that has had an effect on us in this country. 
Because somehow we got into this idea that when you have one bad year, it only can last so long. And then, quote, the recession will be over. And when the recession is over, it will in fact be better than it was in 1980. That's not true, folks. That's not true. It's not necessarily true. Things changed for us very significantly in 1991. Those of us in this church are old enough to know that 1991 was a brutal year in this country. The pie actually grew smaller by 5%. And that was a greater reduction in the size of the pie in any single year previous to 1991 or since. 1991 was the worst economic year the country has had since these figures have been measured. So that, that to some extent was a convenient end of an era. Let's go to the second generation. What happened in the 24 years after 1991? When I told you the pie, everyone gets a slice. In 1991, your slice of your pie was $20,000. Today, your slice of the pie is $22,500. That's an increase of 14% in 24 years. You've gotten a bigger, you're getting now a bigger slice. However, before you can eat all of your slice, the government needs to take out some. The government has to get its revenue. Now, what has happened is, the government has been taking more of your slice. From 1991, the government was taking roughly 13% of your slice. Now the government is taking 18% of your slice. That's the first issue, okay? Secondly, so that after the government slice, the 14% increase now is 8% increase. Okay? Now, one may look at that and say, come to whatever conclusion you come to. But, if we had continued to live as we lived in 1991, we'd be in a different place. Because the 8% is after the cost of living. So you're better off. 8% may not sound like many, but it's after the cost of living. So if you lived the way you today, the way you lived in 1991, you'd be okay. You'd be ahead. The challenge is, we, by and large, have chosen not to do that. We have chosen not to live the way we lived in 1991. Now, some of the reasons were just changing times. Changing times. In 1991, there was no cable. In 1991, there were no cell phones. But once cable became available, we wanted that. Once cell phone, cell phone came, we wanted that. Some of the changing was habits. Over time, man, I ain't got no time for washing. I'm going to do laundry. I don't have any time for cooking. I'm going for fast food. Some of it was a question of taste. Man, that car I was driving in 1991 was okay. But man, there's a brand now that I prefer to drive today. So I want to upgrade my car. So whether it was changing times 
or habit or taste or whatever. We don't live today the way we lived in 1991. And therein lies a major problem. Because every time we changed a habit, it meant more money. And the amount of more money it took was greater than the 8% income increase that we have. And therein lies a major, major problem we in this country have today. The fact of the matter is, on average, our income is not enough. It would have been enough to do what we were doing in 91, but it cannot do what we're doing today. Why is this important? The question is, what did we do? What did we do? We forgot something which our ancestors had taught us. When our outflow consistently exceeds our income, our upkeep will become our downfall. When our outflow consistently exceeds our income, our upkeep will become our downfall. How did we make up this income, this gap between what we make and what we spend? We borrowed. We borrowed. A huge amount of this borrowing became known as consumer loans. Consumer loans, as we in this church know, are different from a mortgage loan, different from a business loan. Consumer loans are generally for personal use, such as cars, furniture, and activities, which, believe it or not, folks, one bank calls summer madness. Summer madness. That's why you borrowed the money for summer madness. Tragically, there are persons who took these consumer loans and today cannot even remember why they borrowed the money. They can't even tell you why they borrowed the money. Certainly, today they have nothing meaningful to show for it. A second tragedy is how much we borrowed. In 1991, all of the consumer loans in the Bahamas totaled about $271 million. That sounds like plenty, but when you break it down for every working person in the country, that was $2,000. That was $2,000 in 91. Since then, what was 271 million in 1991 is now 2.3 billion. Billion. And when you divide that by the number of people who are working, on average, each of us owe $11,500 worth of consumer loans. $11,000. $500 in consumer loans. So while our income on average went up 8%, the amount of our consumer loans went up far more. Over five, almost 500%. It's really worse than that. Because the figures I told are the official records. But everyone in this room, church, sorry, knows there is, they know someone who lends money and that person is not reporting in the central bank. They're not being crooked. It's just unregulated. So if you put what they are doing on top of the official records, the truth is it's worse than what I say. Now, as a result of that, as a result of that, 
folks. Today, or, or let me go to this. How did this happen? What suddenly changed that suddenly now we've borrowed all this money? What happened? What basically changed was government policy. In 1991, if you wanted to borrow a thousand dollars, you would tell something. You couldn't just go to the bank and say, I want to borrow a thousand dollars. You would tell something saved. Specifically, at least three hundred fifty dollars. If you wanted to borrow a thousand, you would tell three fifty. The government in early nineteen in late nineteen ninety two or early nineteen ninety three changed that. They said that was a harsh restriction. It was a harsh restriction. So they said you could now get a loan with no savings. You don't have to save anything. You go to the bank, and the bank will loan you the money. Now the bank knew they were going to let you money just like that. They needed the government to do something else. <coughs> they needed the government to loosen up the rules to grant something called salary deduction. The bank knew if they loaned you their money, Without salary deduction, they may not see you again. But if they have a salary reduction, they don't need to see you again. You understand? Not only did the government allow salary reductions, they did an incredible thing. This, you went to the bank for a loan, which is supposedly for three years or five years. But the salary deduction, ain't safe for the next three years, take it out of my money and send it. The salary reduction letter is written so that that stays there forever, as long as you work. As long as you work. That has had a profound effect, people. What that has done is, that made it easy for the bank to say to you, Anytime you're ready, you can come back and get a little more. You can always come back and get a little more. So there are people in this country, young defense force officers, for example, who signed a salary deduction letter when they were 18, 19, passing out. And today they're 50. And that salary deduction letter is still there. Furthermore, the key was to make it so easy. To make it so easy. You go to borrow the money. A long time ago, you went to borrow money to take land papers. Today, you don't need no land paper. You go, you borrow the money. The salary assignment is on the, on the counter. Two. You need insurance? I don't have any life insurance. No problem, we'll give you some. You never know what rate you are paying for that insurance when you're borrowing money. And you really don't want to. Because if you knew the truth, that may kill you. In fact, it's to the point where people borrow money. Think about this, folks. People who will go from shop to shop to shop to shop for grocery, looking for which grocery store sell incarnation cream the cheapest. But that same person will go and borrow a consumer loan and don't ask the bank what is the interest rate. They don't care. All I know is the loan is approved. There is no wonder banks charge for consumer loans more than twice. You pay on a consumer loan more than twice what you pay on a mortgage loan. More than twice. Ladies and gentlemen, the consequences of this behavior pattern is difficult to overstate. It's difficult to overstate. Let me give you a few examples. Take the individual position first. 
Do you know on average, as a result of what I told you about how big the average consumer loan is, today 12%, at least 12% of your salary goes strictly on interest on the consumer loan. 12% off the top goes in interest. Interest means you are doing nothing on the principal. 12% going on just paying the interest. Two, lack of control over your income. This is an important consideration, folks. Every, I would bet if you go through the records of this church, many businesses as well, every government payday collection on average would have been more than other week Sundays. Every business was waiting, did their businesses on the basis of waiting for government payday because there was more money in circulation. Well, today, you don't control that money. So much of your pay goes, you don't see it. Now, when the government started this policy, they said they would not allow you to protect you, us. The government said we would not allow anyone to salary assign more than 45% of what they make. That was the rule. Over time, however, that rule was never broken. They could tell you that rule was never broken, but I could tell you it was bent. And the way the rule was bent was because they said, we will allow exceptions. We will allow exceptions. But to show we are compassionate, the exceptions must be for emergencies. You didn't have to explain or prove no emergency. All you had to do was say it's an emergency. So therefore, what that meant was that for all practical purposes, that rule went out the window. Thus, you hear people stories of people today who are taking home three dollars and ten dollars and whatever it is. That's how it happened. If you need more proof, let me tell you something. I'm glad you are sitting. Take all the public servants in the Bahamas. All. What if I tell you, on average, seventy two percent of their salary has been assigned. Seventy two percent. All government employees. Seventy two percent. So they see twenty eight percent. And out of that twenty eight percent, they have to buy groceries, cooking gas, utilities, they have to upkeep the cars, they have to educate their children. And of course, they have to tithe. Now you do the math. You do the math. You need to be a very, very, very good economist to make that work. So, what it means is, it affects the church. How could you tithe? You mean to. You mean to but you only got 28% and you have to do all these things. That is the reality. It doesn't end there, folks. Think of the impact on families. Think of the impact on families. Sometimes, to get a consumer loan, despite the salary deduction, they are afraid you may get fired. So they say, bring someone to, quote, stand with you. Bring someone to stand with you. So who do you go to, to quote, stand with you? You go to a brother, a sister, a dear friend. That person, quote, standing with you, 
don't necessarily realize when they are signing that paper. Standing with you there is different from standing with you when you got married. At the end of the wedding reception, the standing with was over. Today, you sitting down at home and the phone ring, Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, that loan you stood with your sister for is now due and we can't find her so we could find you. It doesn't end there because I was only doing my sister a favor. I didn't tell my wife. So now I have to go tell my wife that our family situation is affected. You see where this could begin to ruin relationships, people? It doesn't end there. When I come to you and say, what are you going to do? You got an attitude. That's why Ronnie Butler made the song, we bad pay and we got bad ways. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and give you many other examples. But let me end with one which goes beyond the person. Let's think about the country. Let's think about the country. You hear this thing called mortgage crisis? You see these hundreds and hundreds of homes being advertised. Why is that? It never happened before. Why is that? The answer is very simple, people. There are many reasons, but this is a powerful one, which the banks generally prefer you not to talk about. When you got a mortgage loan for years, you didn't have to do a salary deduction. The bank gave you the mortgage. They did that on the basis that your own values were such. You're going to pay your mortgage. The consumer lenders came along. The government having aided them with all these salary deductions and all these arrangements. And what the consumer lenders did was, by getting the salary deduction, they jumped in front of the mortgage lender with your income. So they said, pay me. What you do with the rest is your business. Now I've just told you what all you have to do with the balance of the money you have, okay? But by jumping the line, so to speak, the consumer lenders took care of themselves. So you now, with the balance of your money, which you did not salary assign, you have to find, pay all these things, and you also got to find something to take to the bank. Now, what is absolutely incredible but no less a figure than the chairman of one of the big consumer banks in the country has said more and more, we, the people, are consciously deciding not to pay the mortgage because we want to keep on our cell phone, not to pay the mortgage because we want to keep on cable. And we are reasoning that, look, if I don't pay my mortgage, it's going to take some time for the banks to put me out the house. But if I don't pay my cable, I can't watch TV tonight. <laughs> so people are saying, let me pay my cable and not my, my mortgage. Think of another example. Think of customer A before a bank. You're a banker. Customer A is one of the persons who you got a consumer loan with and they come to you and say, I want an extension, or I want some more money. You're getting 18%, 19% on that loan. You have to do nothing. They sign the paper, everything is straight. That's customer A. Customer B is a young Bahamian, brilliant young man or woman, has a viable, sensible business plan before you which if that plan is given a chance, they can create jobs, they can help build the country. But on business loans, the bank gets six or seven percent. So I have two customers in the front of me. 
I could make 18, 19% on one, I could make 6 or 7% on the other. More and more, the bankers are going for the 18 or 19%. But when they do that, think of the consequences, people. The dreams, aspirations of our young people who want to help build the country are shattered. What are they going to do? They're shattered. And it doesn't end there. If you shatter those dreams, where does that leave us? Increasingly dependent on, quote, the foreign investor. Now, I'm not against foreign investors. But understand what we're doing. How do you build a country without a greater degree of self-help and self-reliance? How do you do it? When we depend so much on foreign investors, look at what's been happening. You could see more and more the foreign investors are demanding of our government. Forget who is the prime minister. I will bring the money, but you have to give me these things. And more and more these things that they demand are not necessarily things that are in the interest of the Bahamas. <laughs> we the people are making matters even worse by doing two things. One, we won't face the facts. Why is this morning so interesting and important. People, I have done virtually nothing for the last 10 days than think about this. And it's a tribute to our rector. The rector has, see, because what has happened to this parish is exactly what has happened to be the people. It's the same pattern. But the rector had the good judgment to say we can't keep going on like that. Let's stop and take stock. Too many of us are not prepared to stop and take stock. That's the first way in which we're making it worse. So, for example, one person in the family lost their job. No prospect of a new employment. But we just went to school. We don't stop to ask the question. Should we send this boy back to Minnesota? Or should we ask this boy to go to COB until things change? We're not making those type decisions. Some may be painful, but we're at least not making them. We're not thinking about it. I step in out on faith. People, a personal motto I recommend to you is, in Latin, called preque et labore. In English, it means by prayer and by work. By prayer and, A-N-D, by work. Now, the second way in which we are really doing some terrible things to ourselves is gambling. It's gambling. Now, the figures are not out yet as to how bad this is hurting us. But look at the proliferation of web shops, people. Isn't that pretty concrete evidence that we are doing a lot of gambling? Folks, let me tell you something. Gambling breeds poverty. Gambling breeds poverty. And we are doing a lot of gambling. When you put consumer loans and now pile on gambling, we have a lot to pray for, folks. And that brings me towards my conclusion, the way forward. How could civil servants have 72%? These are very intelligent people. These are some of the best and brightest in our country. These are public servants. So the question comes, why would they have done this? And this is something I believe that that's another field. It's not a financial thing, 
But I believe the sociologists, psychologists, and others need to understand why is that? Why do people do that? I don't know the answer, but I believe somewhere along the line there'd be something called insufficient discipline. Insufficient discipline. Because I heard Archbishop Gomez one time explain discipline as deferred gratification, which is a complicated way of saying prepared to wait. Prepared to wait. So I end with this, my brothers and sisters. Whether or not an expanding economy can help turn us around, I'm sure it would help. But I believe an expanding economy alone will not cut it. I don't see how we get out of this situation we're in without more of us looking in the mirror one person at a time and asking the question, what am I doing? Why does someone have 70 per some percent of my salary? Why? Why did I do that? How am I going to change that? Ladies and gentlemen, last week we prayed for an expanding economy. Let's pray again for that. But the next time we pray, let's also pray that more of us will get more and more discipline. Thank you very much.